You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual Honestly, I don't know where to start this week. I could start with how Trump's efforts to gut Obamacare halting the Affordable Care Act's cost-sharing payments to insurers, that's going to result in not just fewer people having health care. It's not just going to disproportionately hurt people living in states that voted for Trump. It's also going to cost the federal government an additional $200 billion. More money spent, fewer people covered. No expenses too great, it seems. No suffering too extreme if it means obliterating the legacy of that black dude. And hey, Dems, listen to Harvard PhD candidate Clint Smith. He tweeted this weekend that Democrats should be running ads and running them right now, letting people know, particularly people in red states wearing red hats, that their health costs are going to be rising or they're going to be losing their health care because of Donald Trump. The worst thing that could happen is that Trump explodes health care, then runs a successful propaganda campaign to blame it on Obama right smith this isn't complicated it's like democrats have the playbook of exactly what trump is going to do and are just staring at it doing nothing uh don't do nothing democrats or or we could start with the piece in the new yorker this morning right when i was sitting down to record about vice president mike pence apparently donald trump thinks it's hilarious that his vp wants to hang gay people so here's hoping Robert Mueller indicts Pence along with Trump, Ivanka, Donald Jr., Jared, Rince, Steve-O, Bannon, and the rest of Vladimir Putin's hee-haw gang. Or we could start with the fact that California is on fire. An area larger than New York City has been destroyed. Forty people are known to be dead. Hundreds are missing. And the president of the United States has had fuck all to say about it. Or that the residents of Puerto Rico, U.S. citizens, are drinking water from contaminated streams and water pumped out of a hazardous waste site because the federal government's response has been so mismanaged. And we could link those two stories by pointing out that Donald Trump doesn't care about brown people or blue states. Or we could start with the fact that rates of sexually transmitted infections are skyrocketing. The big three, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, all way, way up. And yet the Trump administration plans to slash federal funding for treatment and prevention programs by nearly 20%. I can show you a chart that shows as funding decreases, STDs increase. Barbara Vanderpoel, the incoming president of the American STD Association, told the Daily Beast's Mandy Statmiller. It's overwhelmingly consistent, she went on. When the money was there, you see rates going down, down, down. The money goes away, you see rates going up, up, up. Or we could start with Donald Trump speaking at the Value Voters Summit last weekend. Trump was the first sitting president ever to speak at the annual event organized by an anti-LGBT hate group, where Trump promised to make discriminating against LGBT Americans legal in all 50 states. It's currently legal in roughly half. And Trump had this to say as well. You know, we're getting near that beautiful Christmas season that people don't talk about anymore. <laughs> they don't use the word Christmas because it's not politically correct. Well, guess what? We're saying Merry Christmas again. I think Michael Che on Weekend Update on SNL had the best response to that. Dude, people say Merry Christmas all the time. My deli guy is Muslim, and he says Merry Christmas every time he makes me a ham sandwich. <laughs> you know what? I don't want to say Merry Christmas anymore, because I don't like that Trump supporters always want us to be specific when it's about stuff that's important to them. You know, it can't be Happy Holidays. It's got to be Merry Christmas. It can't be Save the Planet. It's got to be America first. But then when somebody wants to stand up for black people or gays or women, they're like, hey, wait a minute. What about everybody else? <laughs> so, you know what? <laughs> so don't think of it as me saying Happy Holidays anymore. Think of it as me saying all holidays matter. Yeah. <laughs> Or I could start with Harvey Weinstein and malpredation and Me Too and how fucked up Twitter is. Or, still looking for a place to start this week's show, we could jump across an ocean and start with the Anglican Church in Australia, which donated $1 million to oppose marriage equality there. There, in Australia, where nearly 20% of Australian children live in poverty. Even if the hungry were fed, the sick cared for, the imprisoned visited, the naked clothed, not just in Australia, but all over the world. Even if Christians had accomplished 
everything Jesus specifically asked his followers to do, there would have to be better uses for whatever monies the church had left over than discriminating against same-sex couples. Or we could start with Google searches in conservative states. I hope you're sitting down. Turns out red state residents Google the most online sexual content. According to a study in the archives of sexual behavior highlighted this weekend by sex researcher and writer Justin Lay Miller. The most frequently Googled terms in places that think sex is for marriage and gay people are icky? Sex, gay sex, porn, XXX, free porn, and gay porn. So looks like they're double dipping on the gay in Alabama. There is so much going on in the world, so much distressing shit going on in the world that by the time I think about all the places I could start, all the terrible, no good, awful things happening right now, all the things I could rant about at the top of the show, I've run out of time to prepare a rant. And all I want to do is get to the questions and get to the conversations because that, unlike reading the news, is always a pleasure. Today's episode is brought to you by Stamps.com. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and printer. And right now you can enjoy the stamp service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale. Go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in my code SAVAGE. That's Stamps.com, click the mic, Enter Savage. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Wink, the wine club that helps you find the wines that you will love. Get $20 off your first order when you go to trywink.com slash savage. Hello, Dan Savage and the tech savvy at risk youth. I'm a cis, gay, 26-year-old male living in a rural section of a southern state. I moved out of New York City over a year ago and haven't been laid since. I'm currently working with a drug screening business my family owns. Part of my job is to perform direct observations on male donors as needed, which ends up being a few times a week. Most of the time, I'm not at all attracted to the person I'm having to watch pee into a cup. Then yesterday happened. A coworker called me in to take over a urine collection since the donor required a direct observation. I remained as professional as I could as I took in how hot he was. When we got into the bathroom for the observation slash collection, he pulled out the biggest white dick I have ever seen. I stayed calm, continued my collection, completed the collection, and then dismissed him. The second he walked out the door, I opened Grinder, praying he was gay. There he was, and after a brief pause to question my ethics, I messaged him. Cut ahead a bit. We're mutually attracted. He's only in the area for a couple months with his job and will have to return for drug tests throughout his time here. We agreed to meet up sometime next week, but he also thinks it would be hot to pull around when he next has to come in for a drug test. I'm fine meeting up outside work, but question pulling around at work. We could logistically make hooking up happen at the office without anyone immediately finding out, and I know his urine won't be compromised, But if something went south, this could easily put me in a difficult situation, not to mention it is unethical. I wouldn't lose my job over this because my family owns the business, but there are plenty of other potentially bad situations. I should also mention this has been a fantasy of mine since I started doing direct observations, but never imagined I would get the opportunity. And like I said, he has the biggest dick for a white guy I've ever seen. What do you think, Dan? Should I blow him at work or just at his hotel? Well, congratulations on this long-held fantasy finally coming true and observing guys filling cups with urine. Nice work if you can get it, and you can get it through your family connections. Uh, But you don't want to screw up the job that you've got. You don't want to freak out or upset your parents. Uh, You don't want to potentially cost uh, your family's company clients. Uh, There's not a direct employee-employer relationship here. Your parent's company is contracted to do work for and with people who work for other companies. Uh, There's a conflict of interest and perhaps your impartiality could be compromised knowing that you two had a romantic connection or even just a hookup connection might call into doubt the validity of the P-test that you administered because if you guys have a relationship outside of work uh, and he is using drugs Maybe you would, to keep the dick coming, swap out clean urine for him to do him a favor and keep that giant old dick in your mouth. But you're not going to do that. 
what you're going to do is you're going to go to his hotel room and you're going to blow him and enjoy him uh, and he's going to enjoy you and enjoy those blowjobs. And then at work, you are not going to blow him. You're going to keep it professional but tense. A lot of erotic tension. You're going to enjoy the erotic tension at work while you are supervising his pee tests. Congratulations. Enjoy. It's been a week. Time's a waste and he's only in town for two months. Go get that dick. I really love him. He's like my best friend, one of the coolest casts around, you know. We get along great. We hardly ever fight. But I'm a nanny, so I'm at these people's houses probably like 40 hours a week, um, some days like 12 hours, and there is this new guy around who is like fixing things on their house and stuff. He's this beautiful Swedish guy, and He's made moves while we've, like, been out drinking before, and I'm, like, kind of guiltily into it. I don't know what to do because I feel so shitty. Um, I'm so shitty because I leave work and go home to my boyfriend, and who I love. Like, I almost want to ask him for an open relationship, but I just seem like that's not right for him. Like, he wouldn't like that, you know? I'd be hurting him. I don't know if I'm young and should just be exploring and fucking this Swedish guy because I really want to. I don't really know what to do about it. I don't know if I should break up with this guy and go explore. And if it works out, I'll come back to him in the end, you know? Who knows? You're already fucking the Swedish guy in your heart. And you're referring, as one of the tech savvy at risk youth pointed out, referring to your boyfriend of five years as this guy over and over again, like this guy on the bus that you don't know from Adam, this guy at the bar who was annoying the shit out of you, this guy that they just hired at your workplace that you don't like very much. You're just this distancing of your boyfriend already. I think that's a pretty good indication, a clear indication that you're done with your boyfriend. Maybe you think of him as a security blanket. You've been with him since you were 19 years old. You live together, extricating yourself from this relationship that I'm sure a large part of your adult identity since you've been with him your almost your entire adult life since you were 19 almost 18 is wrapped up in this relationship and who you are as a couple and extricating yourself from that is going to be a trial but you're either going to cheat on your boyfriend and very likely get caught and blow the relationship up if your boyfriend doesn't appreciate being cheated on and that's not something he can get past or you're going to march in there and ask for the open relationship and be an honest girlfriend who wants to fuck the swedish candy man who's working at the house where she's the nanny and very likely the relationship will blow up because your boyfriend, your best guess, and you know him a lot better than I, doesn't want to be in an open relationship. I think you should go ask the boyfriend for an open relationship. You don't mention the boyfriend's age, but if he is of similar age, if you guys have both been together since before you could legally purchase alcohol, maybe he's ready to transition out of this relationship too. Maybe he's got a wandering arm. Maybe he's already fucked his iteration of the Swedish handy person that he's run across. You never know. But if he's open to openness, if an open relationship is something that he would like, you may get everything you want in the end, which is the security blanket boyfriend that you've been with all of your adult life and the free pass to go bone the Swedish handyman. You can have it all, potentially. And if you can't have it all, you can have something else. You can have your freedom. You can have some time to get out there and explore, to Go out there and meet guys while you're young and single and have a life. And you can circle back then to the boyfriend if he's willing to wait or is single when you're done with your explorations. Or Yahtzee, Yahtzee, you might win. You might get the pass, get the open relationship, keep the boyfriend, fuck the Swedish handyman, but you don't know until you ask. So I think you should definitely play it straight, be honest, go in there and ask. This episode of the Savage Love Cast is brought to you by Wink, the wine club that helps you to find wines you will love. If you don't know much about wine or feel intimidated by all the choices and jargon, Wink can help you to figure out your own tastes. Just take their palate profile quiz and Wink will recommend distinct and interesting wines customized to your palate to be shipped directly to your door every month. And in these dark times, it seems pretty wise, a wise move to stock up on wine 
doesn't it? Wink bases the wines they send you on your taste preferences, and Wink introduces you to new, rare, and custom wines that are not available anywhere else, and they tell you the story behind each one. Terry and I took Wink's palette profile, and we got a bunch of rosé shipped to us because... We are that gay and because no one's bottling semen yet. There is no membership fees at Wink. You can skip any month and cancel any time. And Wink has a 100% satisfaction guarantee. So you will never pay for a bottle you don't like. And Terry and I really liked all three bottles of rosé that we got via Wink. And right now, Wink is offering my listeners $20 off your first order when you go to trywink.com slash Savage. If you want to get some great wines and support the Love Cast, go to trywink, spelled T R Y W I N C, dot com slash savage to get $20 off your first order now. Trywink.com slash savage. Hi, Dan and all. I'm a male poly open, also monogamous person who's two years out ish of uh, an open relationship where my partner sided with the side piece. So I got dumped and lost the dog apartment and uh, everything that goes along with that. Uh, I've moved cities since and have begun a new life. I have existing trauma, I guess, still from her. Yes, I am one of the rare statistics of uh, a female partner physically abusing the male partner and then taking the dog and ending the blah, 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 blah. But anyways, I started seeing somebody in this new city that I am living in. And it's not serious at, uh, yet, but uh, it it seems like very compatible and really nice. But uh, she just divulged that she is in this sort of poly scenario, and uh, the male in this poly scenario just recently told her that he loved her uh, and then she told me this and then I was kind of thinking I should just back out because this seems very messy because of my uh, pre-existing like issues with those sorts of complications the problem is I, I really like this person it seems like it could be very nice, but I just like really fear getting involved in any sort of that drama. But maybe I should just like give her the benefit of the doubt, know that she's know and she knows what she's doing, uh, and that the other couple knows what they're doing. Just kind of wondering what you might think about that. So. To recap, you got your heart stomped pretty badly in a poly relationship, uh, an abusive poly relationship. Yeah, previously. And men do suffer yeah. uh, physical abuse, emotional abuse. Men can be on the receiving end of abuse in abusive relationships. And sometimes that's hard for men to talk about. So credit to you for talking about it uh, because of the stigma uh, around male victims uh, of abuse. So I hope you're talking to a therapist. I hope you've gotten some counseling and I hope you're in a good place and you've asked for help from someone besides just the faggot with the podcast <laughs> yeah that's happened okay good. I, uh, yeah i was i was seeing a lot of people okay i'm glad to hear it okay now getting to your issue the, the problem here you got your heart stomped pretty badly in a polyamorous relationship and along comes a girl in a new city and you discover you're interested in her and you discover she's in a polyamorous relationship and you're a little shy you're, you're a little gun shy or fun shy uh, about getting involved with her because you just had a really bad experience in a polyamorous relationship. And often it's helpful in situations like this to reverse the script, to flip the script. If you'd gotten your heart stopped, someone, not you, someone else, you met someone who said, oh, I just got my heart stopped in a monogamous relationship. So from here on out, it's polyamory for me because that'll protect me from getting my heart stopped. It's like, yeah, you would tell them that you can get your heart stopped in a polyamorous relationship too, right? Yeah. 
So it's a little bit of an irrational leap to conclude because you got your heart stopped in a poly relationship that the fact that this girl's in a poly relationship, when you describe yourself as poly, is a red flag or a reason to run from her. You're, you're, you're leaping to the conclusion that you're likelier to get your heart stomped again. And you might get your heart stomped again. Getting your heart stomped is always a risk. Polyamorous relationship model, monogamous relationship model, it's always a risk. And you can't avoid that risk by avoiding people in particular circumstances. I just think it's, it just seems like a little bit like that's a, that's a little, there's already like a weird sort of consequence or like there's, there's already a, a weird sort of element that's creeping in. That's so that's, I mean, could potentially, it was just the fact that this guy had like told her that he was in love with her and like he, you know, that, that like, she's not his primary partner. Mm hmm. And it seems like that's sort of messy. And then I just don't want any sort of messiness to creep my way when I'm just trying to get away from old messiness. Right. So I know a lot of people in polyamorous relationships who do say I love you to their secondary partners. Is the kind of polyamorous relationship you want to have not actually quite so poly that maybe an open relationship with regular, very special guest stars as opposed to ongoing romantic uh, partners where there may be uh, some commitment yeah, or love so. expressed, maybe that would, you'd be more comfortable with that. So maybe it's poly you need to be moving away from, not necessarily openness, because if you know yourself incapable of being able to honor a monogamous commitment or monogamy would make you happy, and you know you being unhappy in a monogamous relationship would make your partner that you made a monogamous commitment to an ill-advised one miserable, then don't make a monogamous commitment. But there's a way stop in between you know, having three partners and everybody saying I love you to each other uh, and monogamy, and that is... A primary couple, love is only for us. I love yous are only for each other, but we still can fuck other people. We can have a friend with benefits, but we can't have a love interest with benefits. For for my emotional security. You can frame it that way. Is that too possessive? I don't think that's too possessive. You know, what works for you works for you. And if you, you know the thing about having insecurities right. in a monogamous relationship or an open relationship or a polyamorous a uh, multi-partner relationship is putting your insecurities on the table and asking for reasonable accommodations, uh, scrutinizing your own insecurities to make sure they're not manipulative, emotionally abusive weapons that you've disguised as insecurities and you're not attempting to, you know, in an abusive way, control your partner by being a, a weepy bag of slop, right? You, you got to be able to stand on your own mm -hmm. feet. You got to have your shit together. You got to be in good working order. But to say to a partner, well, this I'm comfortable with, and this I, I'm just not comfortable. This just isn't for me because I know that emotionally I don't function well in a relationship where the person I love is in love with someone else. And so the relationship I want is a, a partnership, you know, a primary couple, and the freedom to see other people, the freedom to have three ways, the freedom to have one-offs or to have a, you know, a regular third, but who isn't your lover and who you don't say I love you to and I don't say I love you to mine. And so long as that's all on the table, you know, all relationships are opt-in. If that's unacceptable to someone that you're dating or considering dating, then they can walk away. And if, right. and if the relationship she's in is unacceptable to you, you're free to walk away. Yeah, it's just kind of funny because, I mean, she is – in that position like she's free to walk away from her whole deal and like who knows if there's ever gonna if if this would uh you know become a, a primary like partnership between her and i anyways yeah i mean it's, it's so far away from anything that it seems so hypothetical actually if this is where you are if what i just unpacked fits if it feels right you have to stop calling yourself polyamorous what does polyamory mean many loves oh yeah definitely and if you're not down with you know, multiple loves concurrently sharing one another, polyamory, you shouldn't call yourself polyamorous. That's uh, not truth in advertising uh, on your part. You're, you, you want an open relationship. Very true. Not a polyamorous relationship. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll amend that. You know, there are people out there who are also, who condemn labels and we shouldn't have to labels, but you know what? The more accurately you label yourself, the likelier someone is to pick you off the shelf who wants exactly what you want and exactly what you are. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, totally, yeah. So off with the poly label, Definitely. on with the open R label, and good luck in the future. And, and, and you know, you can say to this girl that, that you're interested in, who someone else is in love with her, 
you can say, you know, the more I've thought about this and the trauma of the last year, uh, my, the relationship I just got out of, I just realized that it's not polyamory I want. And so this is what I want. And if that's not what you want, we're not compatible. Uh, maybe we're compatible sexually. Maybe we're compatible as friends, but not romantically compatible. And we should then part ways uh, with it before it gets ugly and, and think of each other you know, with some regret, but with affection and be buds and not be lovers. And then see what she says. Yeah. That, yeah, that's great advice. Good luck, man. Okay, thanks so much. Sure. Going to the post office can be such a drag. Lines are long. It's always out of the way. And if your post office where you live is anything like my post office where I live, it doesn't smell very good in there. Thankfully, you can avoid the hassle and stank of the post office and instead mail everything from postcards to envelopes to packages, domestic or international, with Stamps.com. Stamps.com lets you buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and your own printer. Simply click print mail and you are done. And unlike the post office, Stamps.com never closes and smells nice. Print postage for letters or packages at your convenience 24-7. Plus, they'll send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage and help you decide the best class of mail based on your needs. You can even get discounts you cannot get at the post office. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips. And right now, you too can enjoy the Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in SAVAGE. That's Stamps.com, enter SAVAGE. Stamps.com, never, ever go to the post office again. Hi, I am calling with a question about the word demisexual. Is this a real thing? I'm just learning about this, and I trust you, Dan, to tell me about stuff like this before I read about it in social media. Because I'm older, and I listen to your show, and I hope you keep me hip. So anyway, is it a real thing? Is it like something psychiatrists, psychologists qualify as a real thing? And if so, what does it mean, and what are the ramifications? Demisexual, demisexuality. It's a real thing. I'm not sure if psychologists and doctors have all embraced it, but quoting from the Asexuality, Visibility, and Education Network's website, a demisexual is a person who does not experience sexual attraction unless they form a strong emotional connection with someone, according to one hypothetical model, a person who identifies as a demisexual does not experience primary sexual attraction, but does experience secondary sexual attraction. In this model, primary sexual attraction is based on outward qualities such as a person's looks, clothes, or personality, while secondary sexual attraction is attraction stemming from a connection, usually romantic, blah, 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 blah. So that's a real thing. It's a thing we didn't used to have a label for. We just would look at some people who were gay, straight, or bi and say, well, that person isn't into someone, can't be intimate or sexual with someone, isn't really even that attracted to someone until they really get to know them. And that was a long list of syllables. That was a whole sentence. That was a couple of paragraphs, a couple of subclauses for me to describe it that way. And somebody came up with the demisexual label to sort of collapse that. As I recently wrote in Savage Love, I have been talking about demisexuality. I didn't let you down. Somehow you missed this. We used to call people who needed to feel a strong emotional bond before wanting to fuck someone people who needed to feel a strong emotional bond before wanting to fuck someone. But Some people concluded that a seven-syllable clinical-sounding term that prospective partners need to Google, demisexuality, is obviously far superior to a short explanatory sentence that doesn't require internet access to understand. So, demisexuality, totes real. And also, not a new thing. Demisexuals have always been with us, and you just got to Google it once, usually, before it sticks in your head forever. Hi, I'm a straight female, and I'm calling regarding a past relationship that ended a year ago. It was originally, um, I met him through his mother, uh, who was a co-worker with me, and uh, he, she really wanted me to meet his son. He is, um, I believe, he was 27 whenever we uh, started talking, and I was 19, and I guess she thought that I was very mature for my age and um, really wanted me to 
help him get over his ex relationship that he had. And it went well for two months. Then all of a sudden, he just stopped texting me out of the blue. And um, I'm not, I guess, quite over it since I do see him since we live in the same town, small town. But I am, I guess my question would be, what reasons would he have to have just stopped texting me out of the blue? Everything was normal. I don't have a reason. I never saw anything that drew him away. But I do know that now he is back together with his ex-girlfriend and now he is engaged to her. So I'm just wanting, I guess, some reasons for closure or just reasons that he might have stopped talking to me um, out of the blue. You don't see any reason, you don't see anything out there that might have drawn him away from you. And in your next breath, he's back with his ex and now they're engaged. The thing that drew him away from you was the relationship with his ex. He wanted to get back together with his ex. There's your closure. There's your reason. Wasn't that hard to unpack? I didn't have to do a deep dive. I didn't have to depose everyone to get to the bottom of this. I didn't have to Perry Mason this shit or Columbo this shit. A couple of 50 and 60 year old pop culture references for the kids. It was right there in your call. And I'm not trying to be cruel. It's just that some people ghost because some people are cowards and that's very frustrating. And, and people shouldn't ghost. They should give you an explanation. Often the explanations people give in order to be kind aren't necessarily truthful. People will say it's not you, it's me, when it's you and you just have to accept that you've been dumped. You've just been dumped. You've been dumped. You, he dumped you for his ex. He wanted to get back together with his ex and you got dumped. So you were 19 when you met him. You only went out for a couple of months. Think about the adults in your life. Think about the people that you know in their 30s and their 40s and think about their relationships, the partnered people you know in their 30s and 40s. And ask yourself how many of them are with people that they met or were dating when they were 19. And the answer is usually none. So this thing that happened to you, as painful as it might be, and it always sucks to be on the receiving end of a cowardly ghosting, isn't a world historical tragedy. And yeah, you're on a ledge when you get dumped, but it's a ledge that most people have been on and most people have talked themselves off of pretty quickly after grieving it. If you're still rending your garments and wondering what happened a year later, you're kind of grieving wrong. You're kind of clinging to this relationship in an unhealthy way. And the closure you seek is as simple as letting this fucking go. If you let it go, it'll slam closed. But you have to let it go. That's a conscious decision, a choice that you have to make for your own sanity. You have to tell yourself what is obvious and was obvious to me and everybody else who heard your call. Left me for his ex and it's over. And I'm a good and decent, lovable, lovely person and I will meet someone else just as most people do because, again, most people, 30s, 40s who are partnered are not with the people that they were dating at 19. So stop attaching so much importance to this brief relationship. Stop obsessing about its end. Give yourself the closure that you've convinced yourself only he can give you. You can give it to yourself by letting it go. Let it go and it will slam shut and you will have your closure. Hey, Dan. I'm a 29-year-old from um, Florida. So I was in a relationship with my husband for about 10 years. We got married about a year and a half ago. Probably shouldn't have gotten married because, you know, things were kind of not doing great. But I don't know. I think we just went through with it because we'd like sent out the invitations and everything like that. When I came home from vacation not too long ago, I realized that he was having an affair for a few weeks or a few months, I'm not sure, and that he wasn't attracted to me anymore and wanted to break up. So obviously, I was really sad and upset, but at the same time, kind of saw it coming. So of course, I went on Tinder. Well, the first Tinder date I go on actually went really well. I saw him a second time, and the second time, he ended up like driving me home, and we ended up uh, having sex, um, which was really good. And he spent the night. We had sex again in the morning, which, you know, was pretty cool. Then he 
uh, went home, told me to text him later. We kind of had loose plans to maybe do something that day, but not anything firm. So I text him later, like, hey, what's up? And I don't hear anything. And I still haven't heard anything. So I'm like 99% sure I'm being ghosted. And that's really fucked up. Why do people do that? Maybe it's my own fault. I guess it is. Like, I probably shouldn't have sex with people so soon because I guess, like, this is something that's upsetting to me. And, like, I don't know. Like, what did I do? Is it because I, like, put out too early? I I don't know. Maybe I'm bad in bed. I haven't had sex with anyone else for, like, 10 years. I don't know. I I just just need answers. Maybe you're bad in bed. Maybe you have halitosis. Maybe you have 15 cats and he doesn't like cats. Maybe you are wearing a MAGA hat. Uh, my ascot eight hat ironically and he didn't pick up on the sarcasm or irony i don't know what the issue was you don't know what the issue was you will never know what the issue is if indeed this guy has ghosted you maybe he lost his phone and he's busily trying to reassemble his contact maybe there was a crisis at work maybe he's a fucking jerk who only wanted one thing from you told you whatever you needed to hear to get it and now that he got it and he's gone he blocked your number and never intends to talk to you again These are mysteries that cannot be solved. Like, what was up with that guy? We will never know. You have to, in a situation like this, instead of shredding yourself, oh, I'm bad and bad, oh, I have halitosis, oh, my MAGA hat was misinterpreted, you just have to tell yourself, that dude was an asshole. And don't attach too much importance to your actions in in this circumstance. There are lots of people out there in long-term, lasting, loving relationships, straight and gay, same-sex and opposite-sex couples, that had one night stands as the start, that had very sleazy beginnings. You can't conclude that that was the fatal error. And if it was, let's think this through. If this guy who had sex with you thought so little of you for having sex with him so soon that he took the fuck off, that he ghosted on you, well, he was not the good and decent guy that you took him for when you decided to fuck him. He was an asshole. You accidentally fucked an asshole and he revealed himself to be an asshole in the wake of that fucking by ghosting you in a way that made you feel perhaps impulse shamed, if not slut shamed. So why are you wringing your hands to this guy is out of your life? If that's who his actions revealed him to be kind of an asshole, good thing he's out of your life. Fucking him quickly. If that's the reason he bolted, removed him from your life quickly and if that's the reason he's bolted he's an asshole and you wanted him out so you got some good sex and this guy revealed himself to be an asshole and he's gone woohoo your vagina it's a sorting hat he's in slytherin you don't have to think about him anymore ever again stop stressing about it you got ghosted it sucks it hurts i get it don't don't allow this experience to warp the choices you make for the rest of your life going forward don't become superstitious i fucked somebody and they disappeared therefore I'm not going to fuck somebody for a very long time next time. Well, you could not fuck somebody for a very long time next time and wind up married for 10 years to somebody that you didn't really like very much who cheated on you. You just can't game it out that way. You have to do what's right, what feels right to you in the moment. And you never know because you can't control other people and you cannot read their minds. And I cannot depose them, which is what it would take to get you the answers that you seek as much as I would love to depose them. So you just have to will yourself to get the fuck over them and move the fuck on. Hi, Dan. Went to the Hump Festival last uh, last year for the very first time and uh, loved it. Had a great time. Very eye-opening. Saw a lot of sort of a diverse uh, sex lives that I'd never seen uh, or witnessed before. Uh, here's my question. I've been with my girlfriend for about a year and a half, and I suppose it's relevant to say that she says she has never seen porn before in her entire life, which I was uh, sort of blown away by when I first heard that. And she doesn't really have an interest in going to the Hump Festival. So is this something I should just sort of give up on and go with my friends and have a good time? I think it'd be really cool if we went, sort of, we could, you know, talk about things. And I just think it could sort of broaden both of our horizons. I might have made a mistake last year by uh, sort of running home and telling her about a certain skit involving a stick of butter. So that's all I'll say about that. Don't want to spoil it. But is this something I should just give up on? Or is there any way I could, uh, you know, encourage her to go and and sort of explain that this can be kind of a, a sex positive, different kind of porn than you would see, you know, what's typical online? 
uh, or is it something I should just, you know, leave it be and go with, go with some other friends and, uh, and have a good time. Hump isn't for everyone. People who saw Hump 2017, which is still touring the country, even as Hump 2017, 2018 is about to open in Seattle and Portland. Now know that there are new and novel ways to butter your toes. That said, I've had this experience at Hump numerous times hosting it where someone has come up to me after screening and said, I hate porn. I don't like porn. My friends dragged me here. I loved Hump. In one case, a woman who approached me and said that I hate pornography. My friends convinced me to come. I was sure I was going to hate this porn festival, but I loved it. In one case, that person who said that very thing to me made a video for the following year's hump, went from hating porn, reluctantly dragged to a porn festival to being in the porn festival next year. Tits and all, everything and all, actually, if I remember correctly. So because of her and others like her, I've said that hump for many people is the porn festival that people who hate porn love. That may not be the case with your girlfriend, though. She knows her own tastes, her own limits. She knows what she's comfortable with, what she's not comfortable with. And you can't drag someone to a porn festival who doesn't want to be at a porn festival. If your girlfriend's listening, I will say this, all the films are five minutes or less. If there's something on the screen that is not to your taste, that you don't want to witness, that you are not enjoying, you can close your eyes. And in a minute or two, it will be over. You're not trapped in some Angels in America nine-hour porn cycle play. I promise. And there's erotica in Hump where nothing graphic is happening, and there are comedy shorts in Hump, and there's animation in Hump. There's just lots of different approaches to erotica and pornography in Hump. Not all of it hardcore, not all of it orifice-focused and orifice-pounding and driven. But not necessarily for everyone. In my experience, though, people who are uncomfortable with porn kind of come to Hump and find something to enjoy about it. Maybe they're just Jane Goodalling their way through Hump and watching the primates and making notes and taking it in in a clinical way. And maybe the, your girlfriend, if she's listening, maybe you would enjoy it for that aspect. But you might want to give it a shot just once because you never know. You might be that woman who hated Hump, didn't want to come, didn't want to see the porn, and next year loves Hump and is in the porn. Hi, Dan. I'm a straight, white, heterosexual cis woman, age 25, in rural Pennsylvania. I have a question about the line between role-playing kink and fetishizing. My fiancé and I overall have very vanilla sex, uh, generally PIV, maybe pecking or bondage, but uh, very rarely, but a few times in our the year five years we've been together. We've enjoyed role play in which I wear a pseudo-Japanese schoolgirl outfit and call him senpai while my fiancé fucks me. I want to stress that neither my partner nor I are attracted to actual school children, school children of any race or ethnicity. But we are both lifelong fans of Japanese culture, especially anime. We have two watched since we were kids and through our teenage years, so it has no doubt been a part of each of our sexual developments. Is this simply a kink for weeaboos, or is it a form of fetishizing the submissive Japanese girl stereotype? I've seen some Japanese schoolgirl porn where the Japanese schoolgirl was the dominatrix who was beating the shit out of someone and was in no way submissive, although the style of clothing, the Japanese schoolgirl clothing, may have telegraphed that and perhaps it was a tension between what she was wearing and what she was doing that fueled what was so wrong and transgressive and sexy and hot for some about this pornography. Is what you're doing okay? A lot of people on Tumblr are going to tell you that it's not okay, but you're not having sex with those people on Tumblr. You're having sex in private with your partner, and you can dress up as anyone you care to dress up as. You can fantasize about anything you care to fantasize about, and other people that you are not having sex with do not have a right to shut down or critique or burst into your bedroom and arrest you for enjoying your fantasies and enjoying the sex life that you've created with your partner. Full fucking stop. That said, I think we are obligated to be thoughtful about what turns us on and why. That doesn't mean that the things that turn us on, once we understand what and why, are going to stop turning us on. We want to carefully compartmentalize those things, though, that are potentially toxic to our, ourselves, to others, to the culture. And for example, and I'll use a gay example to bring this close to home for me, there are a lot of gay guys out there who like to be called faggot when they're getting fucked, who like that kind of abusive, degrading hate speech incorporated into consensual sex with someone that they like, maybe even someone that they love. And I've told those guys who wrestle with that, that so long as there's a firewall between the sex play, between this eroticized degradation, between the fears, and really it's fear that has been transformed by the erotic imagination into a kink, 
Because these words, you know, when you're 13, 14, 15 years old, you live in terror of having them hurled at you. And then when you're 30 years old and you're completely over it and you love your gay life, it can get the adrenaline pumping to hear those words again used in a degrading way by someone who likes you or respects you or someone you wish to call you that as opposed to the person you lived in terror of calling you that when you were 15 fucking years old. So long as there's a firewall between your self-esteem and this play and it doesn't bleed out and you don't regard yourself as in any way inferior and you don't treat other people who are gay as inferior, not a problem. I think the same applies in this circumstance. Perhaps part of what turns you on about this image, this icon, the Japanese schoolgirl, not about the minor thing, but about maybe the cultural stereotype around Asian women being submissive. Maybe that's what turns you on. So long as you build a firewall between that cultural bullshit, that lie about Japanese women and girls, and your attitude toward Japanese people, Japanese women and girls, all to the good. Build that firewall. Construct that firewall. You need to be in dialogue with your erotic imagination and say, yeah, I get why that turns you on and why the, I get why that turns you on. But what's at the root of why that turns you on is a lie, is a stereotype, is a damaging stereotype. So we're going to build a firewall around it. We're going to contain it just in the bedroom. We're not going to let it bleed out. And we're going to scrutinize and interrogate ourselves to make sure it doesn't bleed out into the way we treat other people who may be Japanese schoolgirls or Japanese women or Japanese men. Or other gay men, if you're one of those gay guys who gets off and be called a faggot. And with that scrutiny and that self-interrogation comes the responsibility to be vigilant, to walk the guardrails at the top of that firewall that you built between the shit that your erotic imagination seized on and transubstantiated into kinks and turn-ons and the way you treat other people and the way you view other people and the assumptions you make about other people. Police that vigorously. That is your responsibility. But swearing off something that turns you on because someone that you're not having sex with somewhere, if they found out about it, might be offended. Yeah, no, fuck that. Hi, Dan. This is a straight cis girl from the, uh, California calling. I need some advice about beard burn. I have really sensitive, easily irritated skin, and my boyfriend has really thick and coarse facial hair that gives me terrible beard burn when we make out. My chin first gets red and rashy, and then I actually get scabs on my chin from skin coming off. My boyfriend shaves as often as he can and has also tried growing out his beard and using beard softening oil, but nothing works. We have to make out with my hand held up between our chins. He can't shave too often because he has a history of having really bad acne, so shaving too often makes him break out. Within a few hours of shaving, his stubble returns and makes his face feel like literal sandpaper. It's so painful. <laughs> Maybe he could shave more often if he used a safety razor, which we hear is better for the skin, but I use a safety razor on my legs and private area, and I have to say it does not give a very neat or close shave. Um, can anyone out there recommend anything? I'm sick of rubbing Neosporin on my chin and putting makeup to cover the scabs. Um, also, we've been together for six years now, and it's sad not to be able to make out as if we were teenagers again. I <laughs> uh, hope you have some advice for me. I have a, a solution that you probably won't want to adopt. Google latex mask fetish and you will find your way into the latex mask fetish community. You could or you both could wear these crazy, tight, form-fitting latex masks that just leave your lips exposed when you want to make out. A lot of people out there find it unsexy and it kind of ruins the moment or the mood to get a condom and slip it onto a dick before intercourse, pulling a couple of tight-fitting latex hoods over your head just because you want to make out people into latex hoods might find that sexy people who aren't into latex hoods won't find that process sexy so you're likely to find that sexy but that's my only off the top of my head solution kind of unworkable solution to your problem so kind of not a solution so we'll toss this out to other listeners who may have faced literally faced similar challenges what did you do to fix this or is this one of those things that's just not a fixable problem one of those things you're just going to have to work around but you're never going to be able to solve. Listeners, if you have some ideas for this caller, give us a buzz. Hi, I'm calling with a comment for a caller from episode 572, the woman whose partner didn't want to kiss or cuddle or do any foreplay before jumping into BDSM or kinky sex. And obviously the guy is way out of line. And I just wanted to address something that didn't seem like Dan did in, in the call, which was, 
you sound really hurt, you, the caller. You sound sad, and this guy sounds like he's really shaming you and your preferences and, you know, telling you that maybe you should go fuck other women or because, you know, men can't be expected to kiss or cuddle. If you weren't asking for foreplay at the very beginning, maybe it was because you didn't need it, but maybe it was because you were younger, you were six years younger, and you didn't know how to ask. And now that you're an older, more self-actualized woman, you know what you deserve and what you need. And he may not have matured in the same way. So I would just encourage you to think about that and to think about what it's like being with someone who makes you feel hurt and sad just because you want to come. Hey, Dan, I'm calling about the Wonder Woman episode and the guy whose girl wanted to tell him through an app uh, when she was horny. My wife and I discovered that uh, we can communicate to each other what we were expecting for the night uh, just through what clothing we're wearing. And usually it's uh, whether we're wearing underwear to bed or not or you're sleeping in the nude. Nude means go. Underwear means not tonight. But yeah, any sort of nonverbal cue could work. Uh, a particular object placed on the table, a uh, different scarf, different hat. Yeah, there's lots of ways to tell people that you're interested without having to uh, use the electronics. Hey, Dan, I'm calling with a comment in regards to the guy whose girlfriend has an app that tracks not only her menstrual cycle, but also her arousal. Uh, while I totally get the caller and you maybe being squicked out a bit by this, I would love this. What app is this? Please tell me where I can get this app. And we're going to leave it there. Tickets on sale now in Seattle and Portland and Olympia for the 13th annual Pump Dome Festival. The kickoff of the 13th annual Pump Dome Festival, which will soon be touring the country. Go to humpdomefest.com to get tickets in Seattle, Portland, and Olympia for the brand new, all new, all hilarious, all sexy, all hot. All right, 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you'd like to record a question or a comment for a future show, give us a buzz. 206-302-2064. Follow me on Twitter at FakeDanSavage. Follow Carsey Blanton on Twitter at Carsey Blanton. The Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at Risk Youth and Nancy. We'll all be back at you next week with another installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thanks for downloading.